the reason why we don't record when the music is on is because I don't have permission to put it back up onto YouTube, and I don't want to do that without their permission. Okay, so we are going to just share a couple of things with you before we actually go into the video that we're going to watch. And I have to just shrink this down a little bit and make it to this. So what I wanted to share with you, and Larry's gonna share a little bit too, is that um, what we've been doing, if you don't already know, because nobody's new on here, but we've been looking at the Messianic Bible teachings and what those things really represent. What did Jesus really practice and what did he do and how has things changed over time in the Christian world that we live in? And you know that we're in the time of the Gentiles and things have changed quite a bit. So often our understanding of the Hebrew script scriptures and the New Testament is clouded kind of by centuries of the Western tradition and the way it's all been interpreted. And that's what we're trying to get across to you. When we're doing all these studies, first of all, we're, we're looking at places in Israel that we never knew. I mean, we read about them, but we never saw them. So that's really important what we're doing here. And then we're trying to look at the words, the Hebrew words, and see what, what they really mean. And how did things somehow, not a whole ton, but a little bit, how did it change the way we think, what we've been taught? And remember, I think I said last week during the service that we kind of inherited those teachings. So we don't blame us. And we probably don't even blame the people who taught us. It's that how they were taught and how scripture has been interpreted. So we're trying to help not only you learn, but us learn too. So we got like really what God is trying to say to us. Because sometimes some of the things have been really out in left field that we've learned. So in all these different things that we're talking about, we're, we're trying to pull back the curtain and help us because we're contemporary Christ followers, okay? We're in this generation to understand how the scriptures were understood by the original people that either wrote them or they were written for back then. So the Jewish insights into scripture, it deepens our appreciation for certain Bible passages that we all know. And it's going to enhance our understanding of some of the verses that maybe we found difficult to understand. So that's what we're hoping we're doing on Wednesday nights. And um, we're hoping that this is going to bring you, draw you closer to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is our God. And sometimes, like when people addressed God many years ago, they'd always say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then all of a sudden that got done away with. You don't hear people say that too often. But that is the God that we worship. So let's see. So one thing that um, I wanted to point out, which is an interesting point, and mm -hmm. it's really not anything to do with this, the uh, video we're going to watch tonight. But I just wanted to point some things out to you. And, um, and then uh, Larry's going to point something out to you, too, that, again, isn't really the video, but it's interesting, and it's going to help you, again, to open your eyes to some of the things we were taught that were a little bit off. And, you know, don't just um, listen and, and say, oh, yes, you're totally right. You know, if you don't agree or you want to study more, just tell me and say, you know what? Where did you find that, and how do you know that's true? Because I don't want to ever lead you astray. But before we actually do any of this, honestly, I spend a lot of time trying to make sure that I'm teaching the right thing to you. So what we're going to talk about right now, for me, is Mary Magdalene. Was she actually a prostitute? Now, how many of you learned that she was a prostitute? Everybody learned 
we've all been taught that she was a prostitute, right? That's what we were taught. Do the Gospels actually support the fact that Mary was once a prostitute? What do you think? Somebody tell me. Just quickly. Anybody think that the Gospels support that? Yes, no? Anybody? They wouldn't, no. No. The answer is no. Although we've been taught that through all the time that we study that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, there are several women named Mary mentioned in the Gospels, and we know that. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary of Bethany, who was the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. Mary, the wife of Cleopas. Equally important, though, there are two unnamed women who are expressively identified as sexual sinners. There was the woman who was anointed, who she anointed Jesus' feet with costly perfume and Luke 7, 36 to 50. And then there's an adulteress who the Pharisees brought before Jesus, remember, to see if he was going to condemn her in John 8. And by the way, that particular incident is not found in most ancient manuscripts. So the one where he brought the Pharisees, brought her before Jesus to see if he was going to condemn her, that's not in all Bibles especially the old Bibles. Where did it come from? I don't know. Anyways, the association of Mary Magdalene as being a prostitute, although she's supposed to have been a repentant prostitute, it is a result of the post-New Testament interpretations, which identified her with several other women. They conglomerated the Marys that were talked about, and they all said it was Mary Magdalene. But there's no proof of that. At least one of whom was identified as a prostitute. It was the one that they brought before him and said, okay, she was caught doing this. What do you want to do? And then remember, he said, you without sin cast the first stone. Nobody ever said that was Mary Magdalene, but that's what people assume, and that's what we were taught. Mary was the most common Hebrew name at the time. And it wasn't even Mary, it was Miriam. Simply because somebody was named Mary was a prostitute doesn't mean it was Mary Magdalene. But in the final analysis, there is simply no scriptural <laughs> basis to definitely link those sinful women that the Bible's talking about to Mary Magdalene. So I just thought that is kind of a really cool thing to identify because if I was Mary Magdalene, I wouldn't want the whole world to keep thinking I was a prostitute when I wasn't, right? It's a shame that we assume things. So that was one that when you looked it up and you studied it in the Bible and the Hebrew and you, you started figuring it out, she was never ever identified as a prostitute. So next time, if you ever talk about her, try not to refer to her as a prostitute because we can't prove that she was. What do you think of that tidbit? <laughs> Anybody got anything to say about that? She was a scapegoat. She was a scapegoat? Yeah. Like if all the women are saying, oh, it was Mary Magda, oh, it was Mary, like yeah. everybody's saying that. So. Yeah. You know, she was their excuse. Yeah, but she was never, ever identified in the Bible as actually being the one who did all that stuff. So I think that's pretty interesting. You know, you can be accused of things your whole life and never have done any of them. I am one that knows that very well. <laughs> so, um, okay, so we're going to look at another point. So are we good with that point? You can take that and put it under your belt. You know that now. We're going to take a look at another one. We're going to look at three points tonight. Another one was the, what was the great sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? 
that was destroyed with fire and brimstone? What was the great sin? What is the first thing that comes to your mind when we think about, I think we've talked about this a little bit before. When we think about Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed, what was it? What was the great orgies? Sin? What's that? Orgies. Orgies. Yeah. Okay, Joanne. Yeah. Having same having same sex relations. Same sex relations. Having same sex relations. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? That's about what we think of sexual sin, mostly um, homosexual sin. That's that's what we think of when we ever talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. I want to tell you what the Bible says, okay? So we're going to take a look at what actually it's all about. So this, I think a lot of it, especially for our generation, the younger generation, maybe not so much because they didn't watch it, but most of us, you know, we're so used to watching that movie, the, uh, the Bible, Remember, we used to sit and watch two hours. They'd have an intermission, and you'd come back, watch more of it. And they always showed that scene of all the homosexuals, you know, give me those men, and we want to have sex with them, and all this other stuff. So that's what's planted in our mind about the great sin of Sodom. So the story of how the citizens of Sodom welcomed two strangers gives us an impression that the inhabitants of the city, the people who lived there, were judged for their illicit sexual sins. Yes, Jude, the younger brother of Yeshua, explains that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because they were indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh. So that's in Jude 1 and 7. But sexual uh, depravity was not unique just to Sodom and Gomorrah. So you get that straight. Like sometimes we think, oh, that was a terrible, sinful city and the only city like that, so God had to destroy it. No. Throughout history, throughout even in that time frame, other cities were practicing those kind of sexual behaviors as well as orgies and a whole bunch of other stuff. So... Those things are still with us today. People still practice orgies. People still do all those kind of things. And we don't see fire and brimstone falling out of the sky onto today's immorality, do we? Sometimes I think it should, but we don't because, you know, we're not perfect. Were there other sins and were there other vices that were charged against the cities? And this is the part that I found interesting. That's why I want to share it with you. So from ancient times, there had been different theories trying to identify what was the real problem with Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Talmud preserves a list of opinions that includes sexual immorality, okay? That's there. But guess what else is there as one of the big sins of Sodom and Gomorrah? Stinginess, blasphemy, selfishness, burglary, encroachment, extortion, and injustice. Several of these sins could be derived from the passage in the book of Ezekiel, where the prophet talks about the kingdom of Judah as Sodom. It was in Ezekiel 1649, and it said, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom, she and her daughters had arrogance, abundance of food, and careless ease. But she would not help the poor and the needy. Thus they were haughty and committed abominations before me. That's what the Lord <coughs> said. Therefore, I removed them when I saw it. So that's a scripture talking about Sodom. And you don't even hear God saying the sexual sin, 
that's the thing that that it woke me up because it isn't just that he's talking about that they were arrogant that they never helped the poor and the needy that they they didn't they weren't hospitable to people the prophet I, um, Ezekiel lists sexual immorality as the final straw after all these other injustices that that Sodom and Gomorrah were doing. Ezekiel charged the people with enjoying abundant food and careless ease and neglecting the poor. A charge that if they were charging that right now, how many of us could have that charge against us living in the Western world, you know, um, social injustices, mm -hmm. abundant food, and not taking care of the poor. I don't mean any of you because you're all on the same page with this ministry, but out in the world around us, our friends, our relatives, how many of them look down on the poor? And that was one of the reasons the city was destroyed. Tradition says the primary sin of the men of Sodom and Gomorrah was their inhospitable welcome of the strangers. The Jewish people embellished the story with other tales, like of how badly the people of Sodom treated guests and strangers. The Jewish people are very hospitable when it comes to entertaining. And even in those days when they had nothing, and a lot of other countries are like that. I remember in Ghana, they might not have anything, but they will give you the little that they've got. In the Western world, people aren't like that, unfortunately. So not only, uh, oh, so the people of Sodom came to represent the opposite of hospitality. They treated people terribly. Not only were they sexually deviant, even worse, they were inhospitable. They weren't nice to anybody. So a disciple of Peter followed the Jewish explanation in that he also saw hospitality and inhospitality as the main issues of what the problem was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Isn't that strange after all we've been taught? An account of the hospitality and godliness Lot was saved out of Sodom when all the country around was punished by fire and brimstone. The Lord thus making it manifest that he does not forsake those that hope in him, but gives us such a depart from him to punishment and torture. And God is talking about that in his word. Yeshua may be suggesting to the hospitality explanation for the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah when he tells the disciples to seek hospitality in their homes and villages when they enter. And he tells them, whoever does not receive you or hear your words, you're to go out of that house or that city, shake off the dust off your feet. Truly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So we have to remember when we start bringing all of that up about Sodom and Gomorrah, yes, that was a sin, one of the sins, but it isn't the main sin why God condemned that city. So I thought that was important too for you to know. Now let's it's like Las Vegas. Hmm? It sounds like Las Vegas. Yeah, <laughs> it does. Really? Yeah. The gambling? Yeah. They, 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 they're not hospitable. You come and pay for a room. They'd rather gamble their money than donate it to, to a worthy cause. You know, and they all agreed, oh, maybe I'll make some more. Maybe I'll make some more. Like, when you're talking about it, all I can think of is Las Vegas. Well, yeah. And, and, and some people's hearts that we even know. And, and that's why I said, if, if fire and brimstone was burning down now like it was in those days, how many people 
would be like, boop, gone because of that. Because, and again, not any of you who are on here, all of you have the heart of God. I know you do. But I think it's interesting to find that out. I have another whole study we'll do another time about Sodom and Gomorrah, how we prejudge what was really going on there. And I think it's interesting to to find that out. I think it's something that's important for us to have under our belt so that we understand it. So I have, um, I think I have one more thing we're going to do because then we want to get to that video. We'll save this other thing for next week because um, that will be very long. So Larry, you want to share about the lion from the tribe of Judah? I love the lion of Judah. Jesus, while reaching out to the Samaritan Israelites, did not hide his Judean perspective. You Samaritans worship what, worship what you don't know, and we Judeans worship what we do know. The Samaritan woman, despite her own community's opposition in the claims of David's family to the throne of Israel silently affirmed the reasoning of the younger prophet. Salvation is from the Jews, which in her mind, she had no doubt. And she meant and thought that it truly meant salvation is from the tribe of Judah. And that's from John 4.22. It is likely that Jesus had a text in mind when he was speaking with the Samaritan woman that would help us understand their agreement about the source of salvation being from the Jews. When blessing his sons before he dies, Jacob reflects on the action of Judah, who was now mature and had repented his past sins and actions. Despite not being his firstborn son, Jacob blesses Judah with these words, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he whom it belongs to comes, and to him the obedience of the nations. Genesis 49, 8-10, the book of Revelations explicitly equates Christ Jesus with the lion from the tribe of Judah, mentioned in Jacob's blessings in Genesis 49, 8 to 10, and Revelations 5 to 6. So what we're seeing there, again, from the Jewish perspective, is that, remember when I was talking about the protection upon the Jewish people and that how it says Jesus came to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles and we were talking about that now we're seeing again that even the Samaritan woman was understanding that the and it's right in John 4 22 that the salvation comes from to the is from the Jews or from the tribe of Judah the Jews the tribe of Judah that's where Jew comes from Judah okay so it's, it's interesting, again, that was another tidbit that we wanted to put in there to show you that, and then the part where, that he read in, in Genesis 49, where it says that the scepter <coughs> shall not depart from Judah, uh, nor the ruler's me. staff, is, it, it's not going to depart from his feet until he, uh, whom it belongs to, comes to the nations. What does that tell you? So, you know, people who condemn the Jews or Israel and don't want to have anything to do with it, if, remember, we believe it all or we believe nothing, Genesis is telling us, as well as in Revelation, the, 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 Judean, the Judeans, the tribe of Judah, the Jews, that uh, scepter, which is the power, the authority, 
will not depart from them until he who it belongs to comes. So that's a little different than anything I believe that we've all been taught. And I wanted you to try to understand that a little bit because it's pretty interesting <laughs> to be able to see that every week I'm trying to show you so that you're understanding the power that when God brought, when Jesus was born into that tribe of people, into the Jewish, Judean tribe of Judah people, the lion of the tribe of Judah, did you ever think of what that even means? A lion of the tribe of Judah. Most of the Christians aren't really the tribe of Judah. Yes, we you're grafted in. But he came to them. He is the lion. He is the king of the tribe of Judah. It's so interesting to explore that. So that's just another little tidbit. I'll send you these notes, okay? Because it was a lot for you to have to um, write them all down. But it's very accurate. It's exactly what happened. Before we get into the video now, is there any questions about these three points that we just experienced? Anybody? Julia? Well, I, it's not a question, but... I want to thank Larry for the best giggle I've had in a long time. His t-shirt is hilarious. <laughs> and it's true. <laughs> well, I knew that too, but I didn't want to say so. <laughs> I haven't had such a funny giggle in a long time. And when he moved up and I could actually read it, I had to contain myself because I was bursting in laughter. And I just wanted to thank him for that. That was You're welcome. That and, was you know, and do you know where I got and it? I did enjoy the passages as well. And do you know where I got it? My lovely I'm wife sure. bought it for me when she went down to Florida to visit all of her ancestral people that she met. She thought that that would be a nice one to come back with. <laughs> to speak the truth. Well, it's better her. than... <laughs> It's better than the usual. Someone went to Florida and brought me a stupid t-shirt. You <laughs> yeah, know? Right. So anyway, okay, so getting back to that. So are Sorry. we okay with those couple of teachings? Everybody's kind of got it under their belt. You got it. I'll send you the notes. You can study it. And what I'd like you to do is share those things in a gentle way to people. Because people have been taught this stuff for years. They're not going to want to hear it. They're not going to want to hear that Mary Magdalene is not a prostitute. And they're not going to want to hear that, um, uh, just a minute, Patty, I'll be with you. They're not going to want to hear that Sodom and Gomorrah's main sin was the sexual impure, uh, immorality. They're, they're not going to want to hear that stuff. But you've got proof of it, and you'll have proof when I get you the notes. Um, Patty. Yes. Um I've been a Christian for a long time, but I never understood the when I would see pictures with Jesus with the lion. And I asked my husband about it, and he said, because he is the ruler over Judah. And now that kind of makes sense to me to find that out, you know, because I was like, wait a minute. Oh, hey, that opens my eyes to a whole lot, you know, understanding, you know, the tribe of Judah and all of that. And then to, to realize that he is the ruler, he is the you know, he's over the whole, because of his lineage, you know, of being in that tribe. So Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you see, we don't know these things because most of the time they're not taught unless you go to a place that delves into this, you know. But then it's taking some things a bit out of context of what we learned. So then it becomes like something that people could try to debate and argue we don't want arguing going on, but it's okay. We can even argue with God, remember? <laughs> remember what you learned on Sunday? We can reason with God. So, and, okay, go ahead. And to bring you, and to bring you back, and to bring you into the, into the common day, 
how many people that are on this screen right now have always been told that the lion is the king of the jungle all of those other animal all of those other animals i'm not, i'm talking about symbolisms here too right the lion is the king of the jungle not the biggest but the king right and if you ever watch that kids cartoon that was made lion uh, king. the lion king put that little cub in the place of the people of israel and find out that the learning process and the protection that the Lion of Judah has for those is very realistic in today's society. Da, 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 da. Go ahead, Julia. Okay, Julia. And at the end of our praise worship at the beginning of tonight, he says, the King of Kings. Yeah. And, you know, when you put that phrase in with the king of the jungle and he standing next to God or next to Jesus, pardon me, the king of kings, you know, it really shows that uh, the symbolism, sorry. Yeah. Well, the little, little, whatever his name was, Samba or whatever his name was, that is kind Simba. of like Jesus. And then there's the king who is like God, and then he's presenting his son. Remember, there's a lot of symbolism for Christianity mm -hmm. in there. Okay, we're going to go to our video because now that means we're going to go till 830. So I hope you're all going to be okay with that. But I think you will enjoy this video, and I don't want to take away that from you. So I have to now just... Bear with me for a second because I have to go on. There's going to be something else. And it's just going to take me a second to get to it, okay? So just bear with me. And I um, just have to shrink that down somehow. I, this is where I have my problems. Okay. So, Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen. Great God. God bless you guys. Love you. Okay, we're good. Here we go. Okay, today is June 1st. Please say your name and spell it. I'm God, G-O-D. One of the most powerful truths oh, of on. all of history. I was watching it earlier, so that's why. <laughs> Welcome to the Holy Land in this biblical site of Caesarea Philippi. Few other places in scripture will the location play such a significant role. There was a reason why Christ brought the disciples here. And as we go through this talk, you're going to be touched and impacted by what happened right here. Right here is a place where Peter's confession of who Christ is took place. It was a place that was totally forbidden uh, by the Jews. Now, Caesarea Philippi, this is the name of the area. Caesarea was, it was named after Caesar, so that's where you get Caesarea. And then Philippi, uh, that's from Philip. He was one of the four tetrarchs. The nation of Israel was divided up into four sections. And Philip had this section, so he named it then Caesarea Philippi, because there was a lot of places named after Caesar. So to distinguish this place, it was Caesarea Philippi. That's where it gets its name. Now, Caesarea Philippi was an impressive Greco-Roman city near a huge spring that comes out of a cave and is one of the main sources of the Jordan River. So before the Romans were here, the Greeks were here, and then the Romans came. And there's, and there's this massive spring, one of the main tributaries of the Jordan River, comes right out of the base of this mountain. And you can see we just got here, it's in October, and the water cycle is over. We were here in January a number of years ago, and it was just overflowing. We had to walk in water across the step. Right now, it's probably about five feet or a meter and a half or so lower than that. So a massive amount of water just came out of this mountain. It originally came out of the cave. Now, it's about 30 miles or 48 kilometers north of the Sea of Galilee, and it's at the foothills of Mount Hermon. Now, Mount Hermon is the highest mountain in Israel. It's also close to a high place that Jeroboam has set up. When the nation of Israel divided right after Solomon, about 926 or so BC, then a Jeroboam had a golden calf set up at 
Tel Dan, which we'll be going to, and then at Bethel. And he forbode the people to go to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. He thought that they would defect. So he set up a golden calf here in Tel Dan. So that's just a hop, skip, and a jump away. So anyway, he had this uh, worship of, uh, of a false god just down the road a bit. And then in around 1000 AD, there was a massive earthquake, and it changed the structure of the ground. So now the spring comes out below the cave a little bit. But in its inception, and during the time of Christ, it came right out of the cave. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the historical background, why it's so important to understand that in order to understand really what happened here. Once again, this is the place where Peter declared who Christ was, and Christ said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail or be able to stand against it. So this place has been associated with intense false god worship and evil for many, many years. So you go way back to when Jeroboam set up the, the false god, the golden calf. It, it begins there. That's about 900 B.C. And then the worship of Baal took place here during the whole period of the kings. Okay, so there was worship of the golden calf. Then there began to be worship of Baal here as well. So what I'm going to do is show you the history of this site and all of the, the false god evil worship that took place here. And then under the Greeks in about 300 to 200 B.C., then the Greeks set up worship here to false gods. It became a key place of worship to the fertility god Pan. And, and Pan, this god, was a half-human, half-goat-looking-like creature. So they believed that Pan was the god of fertility and that, therefore, Pan was in charge of whether uh, women having babies, children, uh, the land, the crops. It was the god in charge of fertility. Then Caesarea Philippi was originally called Pan, and then later it became known as Banyan. So today it's become Israel, it's Banyan Park. But it was first called Caesarea Philippi, and then it was named after Pan, and then in Hebrew it was translated to, to Banyas, what it is. Now Herod the Great's son Philip established it as the capital of his territory and named it Caesarea to honor the emperor of Rome. And it became a large, flourishing Roman city. So you had false god worship here, and then down below there was this large Roman city, and there was a Greek city there before that. Philip then uh, created this Roman city down below. Once again, it was a large, flourishing Roman city. It had a large infrastructure, a lot of water, with a natural place, so therefore a lot of people could come to this area, and they did. Now, during the time of Christ, there were five main areas of worship to false gods that took place here. Herod the Great built a temple right at the mouth of the huge spring to honor Augustus Caesar. We had a, a courtyard area to the worship of Pan. There's a temple dedicated to the false goats, two temples, dancing goats, and a lower tomb temple of the dancing goats. It was a worldwide gathering place of worship to numerous false gods, and it was literally considered the gate of the underworld, or Hades, by the known world at that time. He wanted to show you the actual locations of these places, these uh, temples to these false gods here. So you had right at the, over the mouth of the cave was the temple that Herod built for Augustus. So it was right here, and then right in this platform right here, you can see, this was the grotto or the platform to uh, the, the false god uh, Pan or Pan, and you can see these, they had niches here, and niches where they had uh, 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 statues and different things, and, and then they had this area right in here, so this was the area of the uh, false god worship to Pan, and then right over here in this area, here was the temple to the false theater, and then right up here, was the upper platform right over there was the upper platform to the dancing goat and then down below was the lower platform to the dancing goat and uh, because pan was uh, the false god pan pan was considered a half a human half goat like creature then that's where the uh, human males and female goats would mate and then female goats and male goats would mate this was all public and in front of everyone so that's the order that you have so people would gather from all over the known world from all over the roman empire they would come here and, of course, they had, there was a Roman city here. It was the capital uh, during the time of Philip, the, the Tetrarch. And so they would come here, and then they would worship these false gods right here, believing that it was here that the gods would help them. They were ignorant in many occasions, thinking that you know, if a woman needed uh, one of the child couldn't or you know, crop their businesses. So they would travel here to dedicate their businesses, their children, their lives to these false gods. One of the acts of worship to these uh, false gods, to the god of Pan, was that children would literally be thrown alive into the entrance of the cave. Once again, there was, the water came up out of that, and so they would throw their children into the water, and they would just uh, die. And that would appease uh, Pan, Pan, the false god, and they would be blessed by that. 
Now, some even believe that in the area of the dancing goat, that the males would then mate with the uh, female goat, then they would, and this would be public, which is after the second roast, and then they would have male and female goats then <coughs> mating together as well. Just an absolute sick scene had to offer. Once again, it was the central uh, gathering place of false worship in the Roman Empire and all around the area. Now, the disciples obviously felt very uncomfortable coming here because this place was forbidden by the Jews to come to. They would never set foot within miles or kilometers of this place. It was off limits. It was under Gentile control, and it was sick. And they were, and uh, it was just forbidden. They would never come here. However, Jesus purposefully brought his disciples here because he wanted to communicate to them and to us one of the most powerful truths of all of history in all of God's kingdom. So now we have the backdrop of what has taken place here. Once again, thousands of years of history of false worship here, and it really intensifies under the Greeks, and it really intensifies under the Romans, a Roman city here, and all these numerous false gods that are being worshipped here. And it's just an ugly, sick cesspool. So Christ purposefully brings his disciples here. So now what we're going to see is this confession of Peter in Scripture. We're going to understand why this was so vital to Christ that he come and give us this massive paradigm shift regarding his kingdom and regarding the church. So in Matthew 16, 13, we see this confession of Christ that says in Matthew 16, 13, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? So the question is what? Who is Jesus Christ? That's the question. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, that's the anointed Messiah, the Son of of the living God. Now to properly understand the meaning of this passage, we must understand the big question Christ asked and the purpose for which he asked it. The question was about the identity and essence of Jesus Christ. And he was doing this and in the background were all these false gods. So am I one of these or who am I? So the contrast was I am the son of God. I am not one of these false gods. Now, Peter's confession of Christ was a direct revelation from God. It says in Matthew 16, 17. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for, that's Peter, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So this was a direct revelation from God the Father. And then Christ makes this statement, that he's going to build his church upon what Peter has said. So it says in Matthew 16, 18, and Jesus said, And I tell you, you are Peter. Now Peter in Greek is Petros, which is a small pebble. So you are Peter, a small pebble. And on this rock, and rock in Greek is Petra, which is a large, massive rock. So he says, I tell you, you are Peter, a small rock, a small pebble, and I will build my church on this rock, which is Petra, large, massive rock. So Peter is the pebble, and whatever this other thing is, is a rock. We're going to discover what that is. And I will build my church. Whose church is it? Christ's church. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So when he said the gates of hell, what is now in mind? This was considered the gate to hell, the gate to the underworld. This was the largest center of false god worship. The cave was believed to be the cave to the underworld, into the false god uh, underworld. And so he said the gates of hell, right there's the gate in their mind, give you a little secret in order to understand scripture you have to get into a time machine and you have to go back in time and you need to understand 
who is the text is being written to. How would they have understood it? Today, when we read this text, we really don't understand this, and we don't even really understand what a gate is. A gate is a defensive thing. So we'll be looking at that in a moment. So the rock upon which the church is being built is Christ, and he's the cornerstone. And then Christ said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against Christ's church. It says, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Christ purposefully brought his disciples here to these very gates to show them that, his, that the church, his church, that the gates of hell, that all of this garbage, all of this worldwide, in the known world at that time, the center of all this garbage, this won't stand against my church. And frankly, the Jews had this mentality. They had a mentality oftentimes of retreating, of being separate. Okay? So they did not go to these places. Christ says, hey, my church is going to conquer this. This right here, nothing. Nothing. Satan, bring your best. World, bring your best. My my church is going to demolish it. It won't. Stop. What if I told you Oops, that your sorry. only cravings for all your favorite Hang foods on, are not actually cravings at all? It won't stand. So it's just a powerful truth that Christ is uh, communicating here. Now God has designed hey. We're not of the world, but we are in the world, and God has called us to influence in the world, not to retreat, not to run from stuff like this. We're to take it on. So Christ wants his church to be involved in society and reaching every hidden corner for him. So we shouldn't run from the gates of hell. We shouldn't run from the evil. We confront the evil. We bring Christ's light into the evil. Now from Caesarea, Jesus began his journey to Jerusalem to be crucified. So this is the latter part of his ministry. From here, it's a direct beeline to Jerusalem. Okay, Now it's going to take him some time as he does that. But after he does this and he's getting ready to head out, he's going to be something else. So he's communicated that uh, these are the gates of hell. It's not going to stand. And now he's going to communicate to us what kind of commitment he's asking from his followers who are going to be able to do this. You want to be able to conquer these this stuff? Then this is... This is the commitment I'm asking of you, says Jesus. So he's going to the cross. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of the world. 1624. Then Jesus told his disciples, this is right after it, if anyone would come after me, this is the price. If, anyone, if you want to follow me, this is what it looks like. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, not do what you want. It's denial, self-denial. You're no longer Lord. And take up his cross and follow me. Take up his cross. What did the Jews understand? What did the Roman world understand about crosses? To take up your cross meant you carried your beam and you were going to death. It wasn't I had an ailment in my knee and I'm burying my cross. Or I have this little issue. No, sometimes we use it, I'm just you know, kind of burying my cross. No, in that mindset it was you have to be willing to die. You die daily to yourself. You're not the Lord any longer and now you're living for Christ. So you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life, does what you want to do with your life, will lose it. But ever, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So you want to have life? Lose it. Forget about your happiness. Forget about your dreams. Forget about your plans. Seek the Lord, what he has for you, and you'll find your life. A lot of people have issues with self-esteem and all these different issues. Uh, just If you really want self-esteem, you get self-esteem from pleasing the Lord. It's, some, it's a gift he gives to you. You'll never find it in others. You'll never find it in yourself. It's not, it's not possible. It's only found from the Lord as you, as you please him. For what will it profit a man or a person if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. So 
When he comes back, those who haven't followed him, who have saved their lives, they'll be judged. They'll go to hell. Those who have uh, given their lives to Christ, have lost their lives for Christ, and they'll be rewarded as well with eternal life. As we move now into our faith lesson, we now have a greater understanding of what took place here. What I want to communicate, though, also is that what does the term gates mean? The gates of hell will not be able to stand. In ancient times, gates were used for defensive purposes. Okay, so that was usually the weakest point of this city. In Solomon's time, they had these six chamber gates, and they would have people defending them. Okay, so gates were for defensive purposes. So what does that tell you about the church? Is the church on defense, or is the church on offense? The church is on the offense. We are not in the defensive mode. We are not retreating to our churches, retreating to our Christian colleges, and maybe our Christian schools, retreating to different places and avoiding. We're not in retreat mode, kind of in a uh, castle, kind of trying to protect ourselves. Now, all of these things are good. They're all good, and I believe that there's a time and a place to release a young person into the world. I don't believe that that should be at a young age. That's my opinion. Um, but anyway... Uh, we are not in retreat mode. We are not holed up somewhere, just kind of hanging on, trying to protect ourselves from Satan and the world. No, we are on offense. The gates of hell won't be able to stand against us. We are on the offense. We are going. We're sharing the gospel. We're, in, we're involved in politics. We're involved in, in every aspect of what our culture offers to influence it, to bring light into our culture. So we're not on the defense. We're on the offense. That is the... A power of the imagery of the gates of hell won't stand. The gates, once again, you have to understand the gates. The gates are defensive. So we are on the offense. So are we on the offense, influencing our world for Christ, or are we retreating and kind of hiding out? That's a, that's a lesson of faith we can learn from here. Uh, do we truly believe that Christ and his church are more powerful than Satan and the culture we live in? Do we really believe that? Do we believe that we as the church, and who is the church? It's a body, but it's individually, right? We are each living stones building up this, this house, this temple, so to speak. So each one of us is the church. So are we influencing? Are we going? Do we know scripture? Can, can we take God's word accurately into our culture? And are we afraid to do so? Are we going to run when we're labeled as judgmental, as intolerant? Are we going to run from that? Are we going to choose our own self status, our own category, a position in life, our pride maybe? Uh, are, are, are we willing to sacrifice those things? Because we have it unless you're willing to pick up your cross. So if, so if you want to do that, you can't worry about your, your image. You can't worry about what others think about you. you. You live for an audience of one, right? And you take God's word into that culture. And Christ said if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. If they hate me, they'll hate you. And Christ said, blessed are those who are persecuted, for great is their reward in heaven. But a lot of times we're running from all of this because we don't want to lose our status and how people think about us. And all these things. So, so we run from it and we scale everything back. Or we get in line with our culture and we buy its lies and its philosophy because we would rather you know, not be judged in all the glory of men more than the glory of God. I just want to talk about some of the gates of hell that Satan has in our society right now true living gates of hell they have theirs right here in jesus time but we have our gates of hell today and i'll tell you what some of them are the belief that truth is just what each person believes it to be and works for them personally okay so truth is now not an absolute truth is relative if it works for you god bless you if you want jesus that's great if it works for you you know this works for me so whatever works for everyone just whatever you find to be true for you that's one of Satan's gates, and the church is buying it wholesale. The belief that feelings and emotions determine truth and what's right and wrong. So now it's feeling-oriented. And we live in a culture, or many cultures today are happiness-based cultures. If it makes you happy, that is now our God. And many Christians even believe that God exists to make them happy, and therefore, even if they have to do something wrong, it's okay because God really wants them just to be happy. We have the whole prosperity gospel that's, that's teaching. That, that's a gate of hell. The belief that if it feels good, it must be right. And if it makes me happy, it can't be wrong. 
Once again, it's this self-fulfillment is now our God. Interestingly, when Satan tempted Christ, what did Satan offer Christ? Everything we would want, right? Power, food, satisf satisfaction. That, that's what Satan does. And so the church buys the lie that God's purpose for you now is just to make your life easy and happy. That's not what it's about. It's about arriving at spiritual maturity and serving him at whatever cost. It's about an afterlife. It's about eternity. It's not about the now. Here's another gate of hell. The belief that there are no absolute standards of right and wrong that apply to everyone. We kind of alluded to that. And there's just no right and wrong any longer. Here's another one. The belief that truth is rigid, intolerant, and judgmental. Uh, who was I talking to that said that, uh, I think it's England, has just passed a law that biblical uh, Christianity. Okay, so biblical Christianity is incompatible with human dignity. Because if you say that homosexuality is wrong, if you say adultery is wrong, if you say fornication is wrong, you are not giving that person their dignity. So a person's dignity is based in whatever they want to do. It's based in the, the sinful nature. So therefore, truth is not absolute, and you are being intolerant. You are being uh, judgmental. One of the, the most misquoted verses in the Bible is, do not judge, lest you be judged. You look at one little phrase, and you don't look at the whole context of the passage. Because Christ goes on to say, get the log out of your eyes so that you can help your brother. So it's, so it's misunderstood, that whole concept. So you're being judgmental. You're being intolerant. And we have issues going on. There's battles going on right now. So we're going to retreat from all that. We're going to run from all that. Pastors are now coming to the point where, and I know California and the United States are passing laws. I know Canada is passing laws where pastors cannot speak against certain sexual sins or it's now considered a hate crime or hate speech. So anything that the world doesn't agree with is considered hate. What are you going to do? The time is coming, my dear friends, and prepare yourselves. The true followers, persecution is coming. It's on the horizon. And you know something? It's something that's been going on for, for centuries and centuries. It's, there are more martyrs for Christ today than there ever has ever been in the history of the church. There are more people giving their lives for Christ today than there has ever been. So where do you land on all? We have been bathed in such easiness and blessing that we really know little of persecution. And when it costs us something, we scale it down. So those kind of people are not going to conquer the gates of hell. They're not going to do it. And that's why uh, when Christianity was born, it immediately suffered persecution. It, it suffered persecution by the uh, Jews. It suffered persecution by the Romans. It was forbidden. Multitudes of Christians gave their lives for Christ. But guess what happened in 326 AD in the mid-4th century? Well, the Roman Empire embraced Christianity. Why? Because if you're not willing to uh, sacrifice anything, if you're not willing to be persecuted, well, then don't tell me about it. If you're not willing to pay any price for it, it doesn't mean much. So that's why the church has always flourished when it's been persecuted. Why? Because people can see the price you're willing to pay, and it's like, wow, there must be something there. So anyway, here's the gates of hell. Christ had some powerful truths to communicate that what the world has. The best Satan can offer, give me your best. Bring it on. Bring it on Satan. Bring it on the world. Your gates will not stand against my church, and you are the church. And when we take the gospel, we take God's word into our culture, if we're rejected, that's okay. Uh, uh, Paul said, for some we are an aroma of light. For others we are an aroma of death. Okay, so when you speak God's word, he says it will never return void. It will accomplish what it's intended to do. When you speak God's word, when judgment comes to that person, God will use your very words. If they, if they reject, he will use your very words. I sent this person to you. I sent this person to you. And you reject it. So for them, your words are an aroma of death, but they're equally effective. Jeremiah was called. The prophet, they were called to speak to people. God said they won't listen. But why does he do it? Because he's going to use that on judgment day. God is not going to be found guilty or unjust before any person when he sends them to hell. He will justify him, but he will have every means lined up for him. He's not going to, oh, I, oh yeah, you should be in heaven. I, I made a mistake with you. So anyway, uh, if it costs us, that's great. We take God's words, his truths into the gates of hell and they won't stand against them so i hope that you have found this talk challenging meaningful i think after we see all this and understand why christ brought the disciples here he wanted to show them because shortly where were the disciples going to go 
They get mainly ministered in the Jewish circle, right? Now they're going to go into this trash. They're going to go into Rome, the Roman Empire. They're going to go into all these places. And now, now they're going to minister into this. And, and Paul, look at what he suffered. Look at what he suffered to take the gospel. So Christ said, if you want to come after me, take up your cross. Well, Paul had to do it. Had to take up his cross. Had to take the gospel into this trash bin. So he brings them here to show them, hey guys, you're going to be going out. This is what it's like, but guess what? They won't be able to stand against you, nor will they be able to stand against us today. Same thing. Christ's church is powerful. Why? Because Christ is the rock upon which the church is built, not Peter. Bless his heart. We honor him. We admire him. But, the, but Christ's church is not built upon Peter. It is built upon Christ, Amen. upon the rock. That's right. And we see in this background, Christ used every available means to communicate the fact that he was building. But then also, look at this massive rock base. He even used physical nature to communicate that he was the rock too. You know, like this rock right here, that's the kind of rock we're talking We're not talking about a pebble. We're not talking about Peter. We're talking about a rock like this upon Christ. Okay. So, uh, let's unmute. If you can unmute yourself, I'd appreciate that. All right, so what do you think of that? Um, it was shocking. I mean, I never looked into it before and it was shocking. I was actually looking it up after he was talking about it, about the whole Pan thing, Peter Pan being based on that false God. Um, that's like that's a trip because all when you're when you're a kid you're growing up with all that and you don't realize you're actually being taught about this false god that was interesting it is it's scary because a lot yeah. of Walt disney stuff does have a lot of that mixed into it especially since Walt disney passed away there's really bad stuff in that stuff now but um mm -hmm. yeah it, it, these are all eye openers as we watch it. And it's funny and it's interesting, not funny, how Jesus chose Philippi to have that whole situation operating where he was talking about all of that kind of the last time before he goes off to crucifixion and everything. And he's standing in that place where all these false gods have been worshipped for all those years. like golden calf and pan and zeus and the dancing god and all the things that you know thousands of years of false gods were operating out of that area just how it all you know like the devil was like this is my area and this is where i'm gonna although he goes all over the whole earth that's where he had so much of that happening and even just being in that area would probably kind of give you like a little bit of the creeps, but at the same time, you know, you'd know that God has changed that whole area. Um, that's where God, Jesus said, who do you think I am? Who do you think they think I am? And then he said, who do you say I am? And that, you know, he was pointing out, he's the God of all. Don't even worry about that stuff because I am the one and then where he said to Peter or when Peter said to him you are the anointed Messiah you're the son of living God and then he says you got that from God that was from God that wasn't something that you just knew so all of that's going on in that area where so much sin and corruption was happening yet Jesus wasn't afraid to go there that makes me think back to years ago when I was, well, we were just talking about Yahoo Rooms when they used to have that before they had all this stuff. And I went into a room accidentally, but I stayed into it with all people who called themselves vampires. And it was a really bad room of people. But I stayed for some reason because God wanted me to. And I ended up having a private chat and the guy got saved 
whose wife had been praying for him for ages, who was involved in this um, cult. cult, yeah, that they were all worshiping and, and saying mm. that they were vampires and everything, right? So we got, who did we lose? Mary. So, yeah, so that is, um, I just want to read a couple of things that I put down. Oh, you've probably heard that before about Peter being the pebble, but Jesus was the rock. But it makes it even more interesting when you see that location. Didn't, didn't you find that to see that big, 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 huge rock and then he picked up that little pebble? It, it brought it more to life to understand that because, you know, the, the, the churches, like the Catholic Church, believes Peter was the rock. But he wasn't the mm -hmm. rock. That's not what he was even talking about when he said that um so all of that then he talks about the gates of hell can't prevail against him basically and he was standing in the largest center for false worship for so long but he was the rock and nothing will overpower christ that was one thing that was pointed out mm -hmm. and how we are to be involved in society and not run from it and that was an example that Jesus gave. He could have gone anywhere, but he chose to go to the worst of the worst, right? Just like us, you know, if you see a homeless person, don't run away from them, minister to them. Doesn't mean you have to go live on the street with them, but minister to them. If you see somebody that, you know, you don't want to go, I don't want to go in there. I don't want to go through that hassle. That's where you need to be, as long as God is leading you. <clears throat> So he went into there. He says, don't run from evil. <clears throat> Bring the light with you where you go. Mm -hmm. And he says, the price that we have to pay when he said, pick up your cross, that there was a price that we have to pay. And I thought that was really important for me to point out was that deny yourself. Like he said, we always say, oh, well, you know, I got this problem with my sciatica. Or, oh, I have anxiety problem or whatever. You know, and that's my cross I have to bear in life. Well, that's not really what he was talking about. He's talking about you have to deny yourself. And what the cross represented in those days was death. So basically pick up the death cross and die to yourself. And be willing to do that. And you have to want to be able to lose that part of your life in order to live for Christ. It's not easy. And for any of you who have come into ministry now, I've talked to num numerous of you, numbers of you who've had attacks, you know, things that have happened, your, your, your health, uh, finances, uh, uh, marital problems, all kinds of things are happening because you've chosen to serve God. Why do you think those things happen? Do you think I've been a Christian since 1978, but I've been serving in ministry for a long time early. Well, before around 18, 18, 1989, but then afterwards, you know, 1993 was when I was first ordained. And you think I haven't had attacks? Anybody who really knows me, horrible attacks, deaths and marital problems and abuse. And I mean, like, there's not everything. But that's where you have to die to yourself. Sicknesses, all kinds of drastic things. And sometimes, you know, you may think, and I can say most of you on here, that sometimes maybe I'm hard on you. A little hard because I might point something out and you don't want to hear it but I'm doing it because I love you I'm trying to help you because yes you might feel sick or yes you might have a headache or yes your nerves might be a wreck or you may not have money or you may be having a problem with your spouse or whatever it is your car broke down your washing machine broke down, whatever but that doesn't give you reason to back off. 
that doesn't give you reason to fall into the gates of hell. And and so if I'm a little hard sometimes and say to you, well, you know what? The best thing for you to do is to be here. Or you know what? The best thing to do is to trust God for that. Or you, you know, when I tell you those things, it's because I've lived it. I know it and I do it every day. So when I try to tell you, please don't ever take it. I'm trying to tell you exactly what this man just talked about. And this man is trying to tell you what Jesus talked about. So basically we're bringing it right back to what does God want? You will have attacks. Joanne was in the hospital for quite some time, but she still ministered to people, even in the hospital. Think about that. My dad was dying in the hospital. And we, as a family who were around him constantly, ministered to everyone who walked into that room. No matter what you're going through, push on, push forward. Take this study that we learned tonight. Think about the gates there. Think about the gate of hell. Think about all that evil stuff going on. A lot of it was sexual crazy things. Look what he said. The men were mating with the goats right there in front of everybody, <laughs> hoping to produce a pan, a guy like Pan. I mean, that's pretty sick. And they didn't care. It was in front of everybody. This was the thing to do. Well, the thing to do isn't always the thing to do. And that's what we need to learn out of this teaching. It's probably one of the most powerful ones we've watched from this gentleman who's teaching. It's great to see all those locations and identify with that's in the Bible, that's in the Bible. Oh, look, that's where that happened. But tonight was telling us about the gates of hell. And we need to walk through and say nothing is going to, uh, the devil will not catch us in those gates. Whatever the gate is for you. You all have different things. We all do. And really, the best thing you need to, we have each other. We need to rely on that fact that we've got each other. To rely on the fact that when you don't feel good, this is where you should be. Not sitting home and feeling yuckier and yuckier. When you come together with people of like hearts and like minds who are trying their hardest to get through those gates and beyond into the arms of Jesus, we're better off. There's many times I wanna just sit on the couch, on the chair and just say the heck with all this, but you gotta push on. And I know he was teaching that. And he said that the, our gates that we experience right now are things like um, truth is relative. It doesn't really matter. If it works for you, it's fine. You don't want to do it. It's fine. Who cares? Whatever. That's a gate that we have in our society right now. Um, going by feelings and emotions. Well, I don't feel right. Well, I'm sad. Well, I'm this, I'm that. I'm depressed. Hey, right, Larry? The last couple of days, I've been really bummed out because I had that sore foot, constant pain, and a bunch of other things that are bothering me. And I could just say, you know, what if I would have said to you, I'm not going to come on tonight, <coughs> Sunday? What would you have thought? What would happen to the ministry? So you got to push. you got to push, push through that gate. Um, another thing he said was no absolute standards. Everything is right. What's what's wrong is right. What's right is wrong. That's another gate that we're fighting against. That um, anybody who sticks up for the truth is going against human dignity. That's happening right now in our time. You know that. And he said to tell us and that scripture that persecution is coming. And we have to be prepared. And that's another reason why we need each other. 
Who else can you talk to about this persecution? Who else can you talk to about these issues? So I've said what I wrote down, my little notes. I got a couple pages and I'll make sure that you get copies of that. And also, did you want to say something, sir? Oh, <laughs> I definitely want to say something. Mm -hmm. If it's right, and if it's according to the word, then we have to stand behind the word, no matter what, no matter who's calling us liars, no matter who's saying that it's wrong, we have to carry our shield and move our cross, and we have to do what is written in the book. I am up to here with candy coated preachers that want to that want to candy coat everything just so that they can have a congregation or just so that they can set themselves up above where they should be setting themselves is underneath because the people that are looking for trouble are looking in the right spot they're just finding the wrong people enough of this candy coating stuff if it goes against the word of god do not be afraid to say that it goes against the word of god and prove it as timothy said study show yourself approved and when people come up to you and they've got that scoury look on your face because they're you know they they know that you're a believer and that you're not agreeing with their lifestyle or you're not agreeing that your own you are your own personal universe, or that you know there was this great big bang a hundred thousand years, hundreds of thousands of years ago, and that's where we all came from. Stand up. Do not be pushed down by anybody because we serve the King of Kings. Amen. We are children of a living God. And when does you when have you ever went outside as a child and let some other kid that came from a, 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 a came from another family ever run your family down in front of you without you standing up? That's where we need to get to again. We need to stand up for our father. We need to stand up against everything that comes against him because it comes against us too. <coughs> to stop 